I'm Kenneth Wilson, uh, your county administrator and host of Talk of the County. Um, I'm excited uh, this afternoon to be here at Huntington Park uh, with the Columbus Clippers president and general manager, Ken Schnacki and assistant general manager, Mark Lester. Uh, gentlemen, how much uh, excitement there is around finally having baseball in Huntington Park. Uh, spring training is over uh, and the players are, where are the players right now? Well, the players right now landed in St. Paul, Minneapolis a couple of hours ago. We're supposed to open the season there tomorrow night, but they had 10 and a half inches of snow earlier in the week. So we're not sure if we're gonna to get to play tomorrow night or not, that's still to be determined. So we're there for the weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we'll travel home Sunday night and then open the 16th season of Huntington Park on Tuesday, April the 2nd. Wow, 16 seasons already. I can remember just standing in a, in a parking lot on a, on a hot day. <laughs> really hot day. That was a hot, hot, was a hot August night. Yeah, still really hot. That was, hot. that was a hot day. I mean, <laughs> a I, hot and day. I was in a suit oh, as I always am, and I wanted to break out of it that day. So it's amazing that we are in our 16th year. And uh, I'm biased, but it's the greatest ballpark that uh, I know of uh, anywhere. And this, uh, the Columbus Clippers have to be the oldest operating professional franchise in Columbus. It's definitely and, not the new kid on the block. Well, no, we're not. But the you know the Ohio State Buckeyes have been around a long time too. I, I said, but I said professional. Professional. Though. You're okay. the oldest professional franchise yeah. around. Not only are we professional. You're not the new kids on the block. Back in the 1880s, Columbus was actually a major league city for a small period of time. And, and what's even cooler is the fact that uh, we have an affiliation with the Cleveland Guardians. So it's that whole OHIO all the way around, um, that connection there. Um, and what, one of the things I uh, love most about Huntington Park, it is uh, with our theme of every resident every day. Huntington Park is, belongs to the people, and it's very family oriented. So I think that um, that's something that we all are proud of. Our charge is to be affordable, wholesome family entertainment. And one of the great things that we talk about, this is the 48th year of the Clippers, my 48th year with the Clippers. When we started in 1977, a general admission ticket was $5. 48 years later, it's all the way up to $8. Now that is well below inflation. We fought inflation uh, like uh, no one's business. Um, and we also have Diamond Dog Night. How, how old is Diamond Dog Night? You know, I think, you know, I hear of other businesses that brag about keeping prices down, but to still sell a hot dog for a dime. Actually, it started out as 10 cent hot dog night. Oh, you weren't even there then. Nope. About our second year, <laughs> and over time, it, it became Dime a Dog Night. We've actually have trademarked that. And there was a period of time, probably in the mid to late 80s, where I was getting concerned about a Dime a Dog Night. So I tried to go to a two bit dog night, you know, the old two bit, four bit, six mm -hmm. bits a dollar. I thought I was going to get run out of town, so we went. We went directly back to ten cent hot dogs and stayed there forevermore. Uh, I'm glad it's trademarked. Speak to tenure. We talk about you know, in in professional sports, um, teams leave cities, um, general managers come and go, team presidents come and go. Teams are bought and sold every day. But what's special about Huntington Park is that Huntington Park is an asset of the taxpayers of Franklin County. And you've been here, as you stated, almost five decades. How did it, it start? It sounds longer when you say it How like did that. it start? How did it start? Um, well, way back when I graduated from Ohio Northern University in mechanical engineering, and they brought me to Columbus in 1973, I think when they created the Ohio EPA. So being an engineer, I was in charge of air pollution control 
for the state of Ohio. Worked on the, what's the old Seneca Hotel on West Broad Street, East Broad Street, I'm sorry. Um, had that job, it was a pretty good job. Uh, had about 20 some engineers in a secretarial pool. We would go around trying to help companies solve air pollution problems. The problem we had is the US EPA was created ahead of us and their goal was to uh, solve 200 years of air pollution in 200 days. That really didn't make a lot of sense. Spent most of my time in court trying to fight for the permits that we were writing. And uh, Dave Millenfall, a very important man in Columbus, was our PR guy at that time, representing us and trying to, trying to keep us out of trouble. So I just didn't want to stay in engineering and I had an opportunity to moved to Texas and get into baseball. And that was the year they started this movement to bring uh, baseball back to Columbus because as Harold Cooper wound up his tenure as general manager of the old Columbus Jets, the stadium on Mount Street was deteriorating. And finally the Pittsburgh Pirates packed up and, and moved their team out of Columbus because there was no provision for fixing up the stadium and modernizing it. So as you know, Harold became a Franklin County Commissioner at that point in time with Mike Dorian and, and Bob Southwick. And this movement gathered over 85,000 signatures of people who wanted baseball back. Baseball had left Columbus after the 1970 season. So in 1975, the commissioners united and they declared eminent domain on the old ballpark on West Mount Street, which really almost became the Coda Bus Depot that's now on Harmon Avenue. Oh, wow. So the commissioners stepped in and did that and they started, uh, started refurbishing the ballpark to Create the Columbus Clippers, and you know we opened our doors in 1977. So Harold Cooper and the other two had a lot to do with it, and they hired George Sisler to be the general manager. And that first year, there were four of us in the office, and I was a little kid on the totem pole. I've been the last guy hired, but 48 years later, I'm I'm the only guy standing. So I guess some things do work out. How many, uh, what, how does your tenure compare to other uh, executives in AAA baseball? I'm the longest. The next one is Don Logan of Las Vegas. He's starting his 41st year and he wants to know if he's gonna catch me or not. <laughs> I bet they think uh, a lot of these general managers call you for advice on what to do. No. They don't. They yeah. feel they know it. All now. these young people today, they, they think they know the score the minute they get out of college and in the business. You've got to see that in your business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I always set them straight. Try to set them straight. See, I do too, so now they just don't ask me anymore, so they can, <laughs> they can go their own way. Uh, Mark, talk about you, your uh, tenure here with the Columbus Clippers. When did it start? How did you, you didn't just walk in the door as assistant general manager, did you? No, um, I'm just a baby at this. It's only been about 30 years. So I'm, I, I'm a young buck compared to Kent. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I started, uh, you know, my back, Backstory, I guess, as Ken shared his, is is I was at, at Ohio State and um, I was a computer science major. And I was sitting in class one day and I, I I didn't understand what the professor was talking about and, and I really didn't care. And I knew I was in the wrong place. And I had heard about this sports uh, management uh, uh, industry and, and said wow that's that's a job you get paid for that that, that sounds like me uh, and especially when you're you're a terrible baseball player that you can still be part of the game in a different way um, so I, I, you know I, I switched that day and became a business major and, and got my uh, master's in sports management um, and uh, was fortunate enough to catch on as an intern as a lot of our staff did um, that was back in 92. And uh, I was hired uh, when a, uh, a gentleman named Rob Butcher, who just retired from the Reds, um, when he left that opening uh, was the opening for me to come in. And aside from a year when I got out of the business and, and tried something else, uh, I've been rolling since. Great, great, great. 
Um, let's talk about change. How much has um, baseball operations changed, Ken, during your um, tenure? How many uniforms have the Clippers had that you <laughs> uh, I don't know. That, that number probably is somewhere between 50 and 75. I, I don't like a lot of change in uniforms. and We are one of the few teams that really has not changed our logo to any significant point. I think the Clipper ship and the Clipper logo is a wonderful logo because I think fans of all ages can wear it with pride. You know, there's some teams, it's it's a little too childish, it's a little too cartoonish. It might look good on the kids, but some of the parents aren't, aren't so enthralled in, as wearing that logo. I take a lot of pride in our logo. And actually, their first logo was designed by Rick Mock, a local artist who... Uh, who did that for us, and he's he's helped us with some of the small modifications that we've made over the years. The game has really changed. I mean, you know, the, the athletes keep getting better and bigger and stronger, and now the world of analytics has hit us all, and it's not the same game it was 20 or 30 years ago. Um, so much more goes into it with, with the hitters and the pitchers studying charts and tendencies, and you know, where a hitter has, has a red zone where he can power hit the baseball and where he's not so effective and what a pitcher can do to attack that and vice versa, what a hitter looks like when when he's facing a certain pitcher and the pitcher's tendency. So uh, the game, like I said, has changed. There's, there's a lot more analytics involved in studying and studying and studying what they think might happen but that gets a little compounded because these are people playing the game mm -hmm. and they can't, they're not robots, so they can't perform at the same level every day. Just because you see on a chart where they should be able to throw the baseball doesn't mean that they can do that repetitively in a game. So the game itself has indeed changed. There's less players than there were many, many years ago. So these kids, as they come up the line, uh, they don't get as many repetitions. Mm -hmm. Baseball is a game of repetition, mm -hmm. just like some of our jobs are. You know, the more we do the things in our job, the better we get. And you can start yeah. to take shortcuts. You can start to expand your role. Baseball is like that, a game of repetitions. And because there's fewer players, these, play these players are advancing up the line before they're really ready. And, and you see that with some of the mistakes you see every night when you watch a baseball game, even at the big league level, it's happening. Um, there's been a, a, a push to speed up the game. Uh, is the pitch clock uh, still going to be uh, used this upcoming season? Yeah, yeah, it will. Um, we've actually had it, this is four years now. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, we've become, I, I guess AAA is, is and the minor leagues have become a little bit of an experimental mm -hmm. uh, area for some of these rule changes. So we had the pitch clocks before they were introduced to the big leagues, but uh, they're here to stay. Um, and when they were introduced in the big leagues last year, I told a lot of people, I said that traditionalist that hated the thought of a clock in baseball. It's like the one sport that didn't have a clock. They, they were dead set against it. And I told them, I said, you're gonna, you're gonna like this because the game's gonna flow a little at a little better pace and not change the way the game is played at all. And I think that's for the most part held true. Some guys couldn't adjust very well to it, but uh, it's here and uh, here to stay. Um, I'm gonna go totally uh, in a different direction. What's Lucille and Crash's legacy here at the, at the ballpark? <laughs> How long has Lucille and Crash been hanging out? Uh, in, in entertaining bands. Yeah, they've been you hanging, know, they've been hanging out a while. Person. You know, and now that you mention it, I'm not sure I've ever seen you and Lucille in the, in the room at the same time. Are you one of, are you one of the mascots? I might be. I don't know. I've found other duties as a sign. Who knows? Okay. <laughs> well, actually, our first mascot was Captain Clipper. And Captain Flipper ended up looking a little too much like Captain Crunch on the cereal box. Oh my God! And actually scared some Not kids. Like, oh yeah, that's that's, so that's we, trauma. That's childhood. We trauma sent like Captain that. Flipper on a vacation to a, a deserted island, kind of like a 
that old sitcom on TV. So uh, he never came back. So we replaced him with Crash and Lucille. It's nice to have two mascots because we can have action on top of both dugouts and get both sides of the ballpark energized while they're, they're cheering during the game. It allows us to cover twice as many appearances, going to schools and parades and things. So it's been a good addition. Kids love Lucille and Crash. Definitely, I haven't seen kids be afraid of them. How does Lucille and Crash feel about the, the hot dog race when the hot dog, uh, does the hot dog have the name? I, I should know this. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Ricky Relish, Kelly Ketchup, and Mickey Mustard. Ricky Relish. Ricky Relish. I like that. Kelly Ketchup. Kelly, Kelly, Kelly Ketchup. And Mickey Mustard. And Mickey Mustard. So they do have names, and I think Lucille and Crash are pretty happy to take that half inning off. <laughs> you heard that, Franklin County. We got three hot dog names, not, not one, three. They all have their own line of T-shirts. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to skip ahead. <laughs> Let's talk about marketing now. We. Uh, you know, uh, you know, baseball is entertainment. So let's let's talk about marketing here. Um, what uh, what's the future of marketing uh, in for the Columbus Clippers? What's new? What's what's new this that that you can let the listeners of Talk of the County find out first on this podcast? Well, well marketing once again is is somewhat of a repetitive game, and it's a little bit like a team slogan. Those of us that create it, you get tired of it. But by the time we're getting tired of it, sometimes it's just resonating with the majority of the fans. So over time, we have developed a system where we have something planned for every day of the week. For example, Tuesday, Dime a Dog Night. Wednesday, we salute the military and the first responders with a ticket deal. Thursdays are Thirsty Thursdays. Friday, we have $5 Fridays, which also includes a $5 Pepsi and Donatus pizza. Saturday, and Mark will talk to this, a lot of the specials with special guests. And then Sunday, family days, where the, the entire family is admitted for a flat amount. Those are the things that we set as the bottom of our pyramid. And then on top of that, we had all the other things that come along, and I'll let Mark talk to some Like of fireworks. Fireworks. Fireworks are popular. Fireworks, still very popular. Uh, Marvel Night, we do a Marvel Night. We actually have a Marvel Clippers, they call it a Marvelized logo in Jersey that a Marvel designer created that logo. Um, Star Wars Night, always popular, um, which is wild to me because I saw the first one in the theater. Um, and uh, But kids, kids still love Star Wars. Um, yeah, and we do we do things where you know uh, theme to uh, you know TV sitcoms uh, like we've had actors from The Office, we've had actors from Seinfeld, from movies. Uh, this year, Corbin Burnson, if you major league fan, uh, will be here. You know, an opportunity for people to maybe meet someone that they wouldn't have had if we didn't provide it. So we and, and there's a lot of kids promotions, uh, Princess and Pirates Night. The Star Wars night, the Marvel nights, and and uh, try to try to do something for everybody, and and it's these are the things we're known for, um, and we try to add new things. Uh, and you know, this year Harry Potter night for the first time um, we're doing, and a special jersey uh, we'll wear for that, and um, try to add new things every year, but but keep the things that people really enjoy in place as best we can. And, you know, you you brought up marketing. We have not stopped for a commercial break. Have you not gone out and sold? I was going to get to that next, Mr. Snocky. I was going <laughs> to say to the listeners of this podcast that Clippers gear is online. And I'm looking in the background at a, at a real nice selection of hats. Uh, and everyone likes a nice Chris hat. That classic navy blue with the red trim. So uh, podcast listeners, go online. To the Clippers Pro Shop. What's the website for the Pro Shop? Go to ClippersBaseball.com and you'll get there. ClippersBaseball.com. Buy some nice gear. Uh, 70 uniform changes probably over 40 some odd years, but the Clippers have maintained a classic look. So anything you find will look good on you. That was good. 
That was really good. Yeah, I mean, hey, it's the people's team. We want them to wear some gear out there, you know, because uh, the Clippers are, you know, the the uh, franchise uh, in Franklin County. We're the, you're not the new kids on the block. Like I said, you've been yeah. around. Been around for a long been time. Been around, been around. And, and there's something to be said about longevity. It's like it's like classical music, you know. You got to get, get credit where credit is due. Uh, also, the, this ballpark has been named by publication uh, best ballpark, ballpark of the year. Uh, with that being said, we all love Huntington Park. Is there anything, Ken, you miss about Cooper Stadium from a nostalgia standpoint or, or some asset of it? Do you miss the shag carpet? What do you miss? Well, we had, you know, we had shag carpet, as you put it, for the first 22 years, but the last 10 years we actually had grass. So we, you know, we had made the changeover. Uh, you know, I never thought that Huntington Park would come along in my lifetime, let alone my tenure. I mean, we kept trying to take Cooper Stadium. My goal back then was to try to make it the Wrigley Field of minor league baseball. But what happened in the city of Columbus is you got to the point where they spent hundreds of millions of dollars on redoing the football stadium. They built the Schottenstein Center to replace St. John. They built the first crew stadium at the fairgrounds mm -hmm. and they built Nationwide Arena. And when all those things happened, we couldn't keep up with the Joneses. We couldn't make enough changes on Mound Street to kind of combat that and, and be a player in that area. So we were losing ground. And then people, I was actually in, in the middle of a design uh, of redoing all the suites at Cooper Stadium when the subject came up about the Clippers moving. You know, you remember that Nationwide Arena and the Crew Stadium were both supposed to be down here and the voters defeated that like three or four times before uh, they went on and built the arena privately and built Crew Stadium privately up at the fairgrounds. So this, this parcel of land was sitting here just outside of where the penitentiary sat. Uh, and as you said, on that hot August day, it was just an old ground field where they had stored things from the penitentiary and people kept trying to move us around town. I mean, uh, they talked, I had to go out and look at sites out at, uh, out east where Easton is. Uh, they looked at sites at a little bit of Grandview. We looked at some sites in South Columbus. I, they even took me up to Polaris and wanted to look at sites there. And I said, I don't think that the Franklin County ballpark is going to be built in Delaware County. Just saying, just saying, I guess anything right, can happen. Right. So it kept coming back to this eight acre track of land here in the arena district. And as we kept, you know, you listen to everyone's talk and everyone's opinion and you'd go with the pluses and minuses and we kept circling back to here to where we finally got a consensus if the clippers move this is where they should move so can, uh, I, re I recall the there was a pretty comprehensive study done yes and uh the voices of a lot of stakeholders mm -hmm. went into determining what was the best uh place to uh move to mm -hmm. and then how do we uh, make use of the, the land that uh, Cooper's on right now. It's been a lot of work. A lot of work went into to this park being here, and it's been yes. a great. It's been a great a great move to say the least. Um, it's been a success by anyone's measure. Way above our expectations. You know, it was still yeah. This you know you went through a who would have thought during your career you went through a pandemic yeah. that impacted professional sports, collegiate sports, sports across the board. And you know, when, and when new places open, there's usually a honeymoon period of three to five years. Like I said, we're about to start the 16th year here. And last year we were second in the nation out of 120 teams in attendance. So the love affair with the community and the Clippers has not, has not lost its luster. It actually keeps on growing and sustaining itself. And to have that kind of continuity over 16 years is really almost unheard of in any industry. You know, baseball goes with summer barbecues. Baseball seen as America's pastime. You know, we talked, we, we, we had lighthearted conversation around 
um, a hot dog, you know. Who who doesn't know, take me out to the ballpark and, and buy me some peanuts and cracker jacks. I don't care about it. You know. Who, I mean, that is what baseball is. Mm-hmm. Uh, how do you keep, how do we, how do we uh, keep that in a, in a 2.0 world? How do we, how do we, you know, when, when, it, when you're challenged by esports, you're challenged by, there's so many entertainment options. Yeah, I think, I think that part of that, that's what, part of what baseball has realized that they were having a problem with the, the pace of the game and the length of the games. You know, if you try to watch a game on TV, it was a good three and a half hours. If it was Yankees, Red Sox, it was over four hours. Um, and, and certainly the concern was of losing some people. So the pace of play initiatives have, have, uh, have been introduced to try to address some of that to, uh, to, to keep a better flow, a better pace, you know, uh, maybe a shorter, shorter time period that people might watch it. You know, and it was always disheartening when you saw families leaving with their kids in the sixth inning because it was already getting late and now they're staying till the end. So I think some of those things have, have helped, you know, catching attention spans is, is as you said, it's very difficult uh, these days. But, you know, baseball is a very casual game. Um, you can, it's got the natural breaks. You can talk, you can walk around. It's, uh, and I think that, uh, you know, having a facility that, that people enjoy coming to, it's easy to get to keeping prices affordable. You know, I, I, I think it will translate to the next generation. Is there, would there ever be changes or are there changes in the game of baseball around traditions such as the seventh inning stretch? I don't, not yet. <laughs> I don't see that happening. No, I mean, they keep trying to improve. You know, like it said, shorten the game on the field, but you know, things like the your first pitch, your ceremonial seventh inning stretch, your take me out to the ball game. Those things are so tied into the American fabric. I don't see those changing. Let's talk about um, community engagement, community um, ownership. Um, newer generations that may not have the history of the Clippers. Uh, people that may not realize that the Clippers is not a, uh, a privately owned enterprise and there's reasons why the ticket prices are only to be increased three dollars for a general admission. Uh, that's very intentional actions of the leadership of the Clippers. Um, that is, you know, the, even in the design of the ballpark. The, uh, it is a very kid-friendly ballpark. It's stuff for kids to do all around the, the, uh, the ballpark. But talk a little bit, uh, either one of you, about how do we engage fans in the local community to foster that support of the team that's vital. Well, you know, all of that has really changed. I mean, 20 or 30 years ago, you would look upon the hometown newspaper and the radio stations for getting the word out. But social media has changed all of that. And young people are more engaged in their phones than in reading magazines and and newspapers and things. So, you know, Mark and his crew to that regard, that's where you have to go. And, and they tell you that when a family sits down around their kitchen table and they talk about things to do as a family, you have to be one of the first three things that comes to mind of, of what they want to do, which is one of the reasons we understand that moms are so important here. The ballpark needs to be clean. It needs to be family friendly. The restrooms need to be accessible. And if mom is okay coming to the ballpark, She's also okay then if her kids or her family comes and she doesn't attend. So that's a never ending battle that you try to stay in front of. And as you said, I mean, every year there's just more and more choices that people get to make of how they're gonna spend their entertainment dollar. And it's how we spend all of our time trying to make sure we stay at the forefront of that. Mm-hmm. What is our relationships with the schools and, uh, and uh, our local wide why uh, YMCA, YWCA? What are, what is our relationship with those groups? The summer camps. 
Well, we do we do a lot with them. We have we have a lot of summer camp outings, and we have a huge program with Safe Light in the Columbus Library that gets families to use their library card. And if they do that, then they qualify for clipper tickets that you can get at all 23 branches of the Columbus Public Library. They were so happy with the program last year that it's already starting to reach out into the suburbs. Both Hilliard and Upper Arlington have signed on this year. You know, we've done a couple of test programs with the Columbus Public Schools on trying to increase attendance. So we did a test program a couple years ago with selected schools and according to school officials, we increased attendance in that six week period about 75%. And they also got Clipper tickets. So we use tickets and the players as a mythology to try to help the community and, and move this forward and do some important initiatives. And you know, we host a lot of fundraisers for uh, the arthritis walk and, and charities around town. We're one of the big sponsors of the Miracle League of Dublin, mm -hmm. which is a artificial field uh, we, for kids that are severely handicapped. They're so handicapped that they need a buddy to try to help them get around the bases. The buddies all wear clipper shirts and we have those kids down for a game or two during the year. We actually go up to Dublin one time with our promo team, our hot dogs, our mascots, and give them the clipper experience at their field so they can really feel special on a day. So we do, we try to get as much clipper engagement and activity as we can. You know, we don't get to all the groups. The Buckeye Ranch is another group we interact a lot with. So we take a lot of pride in that. We keep trying to expand that program. I know you've always, um, been good to our veterans yes. and, and, and having uh, recognition and, and events for our veterans and our first responders as yes. well. So I want to credit the leadership uh, for that because that means a lot to our community. And those those people mean a lot to all of us. Yeah. Very much. Um, you know, uh, they, uh, I know our seniors each year that's one of the office on Asians more most popular events when they get to come out and get a box lunch and and, and, a, and a water and, and, and take in a ball game. That's yeah, yeah, come on and help us pack those 1500 box lunches <laughs> we have on that day, Ken. <laughs> okay, I you heard that. I got to come help uh, pack, pack some box lunches for, for our seniors. I usually, um, I've, I've been there a number of years for that event. It's, it's a great event. It is. Uh, it's it a is. great event for our seniors. Um, am I allowed to talk about the Savannah Bananas and no. that? Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, didn't you know. Didn't know. Right I'm, the, I'm the host, but I had that, I, you know, copyrights and such, and that's a big deal. Coming the Harlem here. Globetrotters of baseball, the Savannah yeah. Bananas. For our podcasters, uh, what what is it? Is is it a is it a is it's, it's the equivalent of the invisible basketball if we if we make that connection with the Hall of Flow trials to baseball? It's baseball and, and tricks. Yes, and people walking on stilts. You might see anything, right? Right. Guy coming up with his bat actually on fire. He's hot. A fan catching a foul ball and could be an out. Wow. Okay. That's so, they, so we we're pretty we're pretty fortunate that to have something unique like this to come to Franklin County because uh, they could just they can go anywhere. I understand. It. Yeah, they this out is their second year of a worldwide tour, and we we're the we're the only new city this year that actually got three dates. And also for the first time, they stepped into the major league market. So they're going to six major league cities one day only. They've already done Houston. They'll actually be at Cleveland sometime in August. But they're coming here in May and, you know, they they have all the grandstand seats and they've had a ticket lottery. And you know, we've got a capacity of 10,000. So for the three nights, that's 30,000 total tickets max. They had a 170,000 ticket lottery request for those 30,000 tickets. Wow, wow, that's gonna be, that's gonna be a big deal. Um, the residents of Franklin County, when they take in sporting events, um, they like to win. They 
like to go to games. It's a lot more fun to attend the sporting event when the scoreboard at the end says the home team won. What is going to be the quality of the product that will be stepping on the field for opening day here at Huntington Park? What kind of opt is there optimism in the air? Well, there's always optimism in the air. The, you know, the problem is everybody wants to win. And the problem is these are human beings and they have a tendency to get hurt. You know, we were decimated last year because when we came north, the five guys that we thought were going to be our starting pitching, three of them ended up in Cleveland within the first two weeks of the season. So you just kind of kind of roll with the punches. I agree with what you're saying. Everyone associates winning with having a good time. And you see that with Ohio State football. But they play a lot less games, so the winning is, is more crucial on that individual Saturday. We play 150 games. We play 75 at home. I, I want us to be competitive. I want us to be in the game. But we realize we can't win the game every night. Mm -hmm. So we offset that by trying to make sure that everybody has a good time, that we include everybody in the evening. And I think one of the things our staff gets a lot of accolades for, I think we might be the only facility in town that welcomes people when they come into the ballpark, has friendly ushers and people that serve them throughout the game, and then actually go stand at the gates and they're leaving and thank you and thank them for coming. And it gives you a, a really good feeling in your heart to see all these people leaving with their families that have had a good time. So we really hang our hat on that, but we do. We do want to win. We won 11 Governor's Cup championships in our 48 years, which is more than anybody else in the history of AAA baseball. And the next club behind us has won 10, but they didn't do it in 46 years. They did it in 76 years. So our, our record has been pretty darn good for the time we've been here as the Clippers. Great, great, great. Um, are there any uh, capital improvements that fans will see when they come in versus last year? No, not really. Um, you know, we're an outdoor facility in a temperature climate that has four seasons. Um, we take a lot of pride in fans looking at the ballpark and saying, how old is this? This looks brand new. We spend a lot of time on painting and cleaning and power washing. You know, we've got that eight acre footprint that doesn't allow us to do an awful lot of expansion, but the ballpark looks pretty darn nice. Pretty nice, huh? And with, with the help of robots. The robotic <laughs> mower. The robotic mower. The robotic lawnmower. The robotic lawnmower is pretty, pretty cool podcasters it's pretty a cool pretty cool thing to see some people have those though uh more and more res residents are buying those and it just goes out and does its thing and go parks itself when it's done um the 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 turf is relatively new it was replaced a few seasons ago in 2018 for our 10th year when we hosted the triple a all-star game in the national championship game. how long does turf if well taken care of, which is the case here. About eight to 10 years. Eight to 10 years. Um, I'm, uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a sports guy, but I don't know behind the scenes. Is tobacco still popular? Chewing tobacco, is chewing tobacco still popular in baseball? It's not allowed at our level. It is not allowed? Yeah. Okay. At our level. Sunflower seeds so, are alive. Very popular. Alive. And they are messy. <laughs> you see so the dugout at, at the end of the game. They are messy. Folks, Sorry, I was going to ask. I, 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 I was going to sunflower seeds were next on uh, my list. I was going to do players buy their own sunflower seeds. Or how oh, many, heavens, no. Or how many, how many, how many tons of sunflower seeds? Facts that you can only get here on talk of the county when talking with leadership of the Columbus Clippers. How many, How much uh, we spend in sunflower seeds a year? Well, help, Adam. I would, I'd say a little over, uh, probably 3,000. 3, 3,000 bags? Yeah, about 3,000 bags. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's pounds. Uh, I was going to say dollars. Okay. $3,000 in sunflower seeds. That's a lot. What's the brand of choice? Is it the big league sunflower seeds? Chinook is our current brand. 
Chinook sunflower seeds. We're, we're talking off camera. Is that a Chinook. lot on a podcast? Yes. <laughs> That's the beauty of it. We okay. can talk off camera if we need to. Um, bubble gum. Double bubble. Yeah. Double bubble. I can give you that in pounds. We just ordered about uh, 60 pounds. 65 pounds, yep. yep. 65 pounds of bubble gum. Mm-hmm. Flavor of choice. We got Which all is flavors. one for all flavors. Mm-hmm. Got sugar free too. Mm-hmm. And sugar free. Guys got to have nice teeth. <laughs> We're always watching for them. <laughs> got it. Um, and Here's you, one for you. How many baseballs do you think we go through a game? A game? Or a season? A season? I would think you probably go through about... How many dozen? Oh, I was going to say 15,000 baseballs in a season. Mm, yeah, a thousand dozen or so. Yeah. Pretty good guess, sir. I, I, I watch enough sports and realize how the ball would get scuffed up and need to be replaced. Or knocked in the stands. Because fans catch a lot of baseballs. You hope you got a good year. But foul balls go in the stands too, though. Oh yeah. But you got really nice netting here. We, we have some of the best netting in the country, podcasters at Huntington Park. We catch a lot of balls that way. You kind of have fan to protect, safety is key. You have to kind of protect the fans from them, themselves. There's so much distraction today when you've got kids with you, you've got cell phones, you're trying to take pictures. And that ball comes off that bat that fast. So, yeah, that netting that we've extended, we did that in 2019. That's That's been a godsend. Um, since we, we, I'm going to go back to marketing. What's the official baseball bat of the Columbus Clippers? There this, really isn't. No, there's there 15 really, there's different. Each player yeah. decides what, yeah. what bat. There's 15 want. different companies that are licensed, but there is one yep. licensed company in Central Ohio. Phoenix Bats. Phoenix Bats. Plain Bats. City is yep. one of baseball's official licensed bat manufacturers. Yep. They do tours. It's it's a it's worth checking out. Got to get that information to uh, experience Columbus to go on a bat tour, see bats. Um, the design of Huntington Park. Is there any other ballparks that inspired the design? Of or it's just well, a written, it's true no, no. original. When we, no, when we sat down and we talked about it, we wanted to kind of pre- preserve the history of some of the iconic ballparks. So you know, our right field wall is, is our mini green monster. It's 22 feet tall. The green monster in Fenway Park in Boston is 37 feet tall. You stand out on Nationwide Boulevard and you look into the ballpark underneath the... Uh, big scoreboard that's they have the same experience in san francisco i think it's called oracle park now uh our center field backdrop raises and lowers when you're at a clippers game you always see it up but when we go on the road we lower that backdrop so you have beautiful views into the ballpark from neil and nationwide Mm -hmm. the only other city or the only other ballpark in the country that does that is the backdrop at staten island they lower it so you can see the new york skyline then in left field, that big three-story brick building, that's our tribute to Camden Yards in Baltimore. And then the little bleachers on top of the roof up there, that's like sitting on the rooftops at Wrigley Field. So we tried to take some of the features of some of the iconic ballparks and mix them into what we want Huntington Park to be. All right, what is the, what's the most popular uh, concession item? Uh, at the ballpark and, and gross sales. Still hot dogs. Still hot dogs. What about brats? Is the is is the is brats a selective thing? Not really. That's a like a that's a newer thing in baseball. I mean, we sell a decent amount. We sell a lot of popcorn. We sell a lot of popcorn. Well, that's, you know, a lot of hot dogs. We've got vegan free vegan items and stuff. I mean, once again, the the food tastes of the American public are ever changing. So you try to make sure that you've got options that can fit in all categories. We've got some gluten-free items now, we've got salads. You just try to accommodate everybody as best you can. Yeah. I saw the Tokyo Giants. Talk about diversity in food at a ballpark. (laughs) 
It was a little bit of everything, okay? A little bit of everything. Um, hot dogs, of course, but a whole lot of other uh, different things. Yes. Um, Kim, we always like to um, ask questions like, beat your mouthless. What's, what, you know, because we want, we want to get a little bit of inside information. So what's your question? Do you like beaches or mountains? Hmm. Probably beaches. Okay. What about you, Mark? Beaches. All the way. Being, about you? Being beaches. I'm here in Ohio. Of course, I want to see the beach. <laughs> exactly. Uh, you you got to leave Ohio to see either a beach that's or a mountain. Saying, so I, I, that's why I want to get away to see a beach. I mean, and, I got an anthill in my backyard. And, and I, I can't be, you know, we don't, we don't have, yeah, we're not even hilly. <laughs> So it would be mountains. <laughs> um, so we, you know, what does Ken Schnocky do in the off season? Work on the next season. That's an answer that's from somebody that's been dedicated to the game of baseball. Yep. What about you, Mar? You know, probably same answer, really. I say, you know, there are people always say, what do you do during the off season? They think we go home and wait till – spring training and uh, really that's when the, the a lot of the big work's getting done so but you know certainly enjoy our personal time try to try to get away travel a little bit and uh enjoy some of the the things this uh the city has to offer concerts and restaurants and all nine yards i can safely say that this is my 48th year with the clippers and i can look you in the face and tell you that i don't think i've ever worked a day in my life that's, that's the advantage of having a job that's also your hobby and your avocation. You found your passion. You found your passion. Found your passion. Something in the neighborhood of passion is music. What is what is Ken Snocky's favorite song? I, I'm an oldies guy. So, you know, we have dinner on the diamond and the young staff hates it because I bring in these acts and they have no idea who they are. I mean, the first group we did was the association, Wendy, Cherish, Never My Love. Um, we have the Love and Spoonful coming this year. So uh, I'm a 60s guy and I just I just love that music. I listen to 60s on 6 on Sirius Radio. I'm pretty good friends with Flash Phelps, the morning host. So uh, that's that's my cup of tea. Buy your tickets to see Love and Spoonful. The Love and Spoonful. Love Do you believe in magic? Do you know that? Yes. I've okay, heard there you that. go. You've yeah. heard of yeah. that. Yeah, I've heard that. I've heard <laughs> Okay. That. So, Mark, what, what about you? What's your genre? <laughs> yes. What's your genre? I'm a classic rock guy. Uh, so, I just, yes, Kiss I was. Kiss Cheap Trick. I was, yeah, probably my two favorite bands. I was at the, the final Kiss show in New York City at Madison Square Garden in December. And uh, that, that was a great experience with one of our former players who I, when I met him here, he was he, a young guy, but a big classic rock fan. That was his favorite band that he got from his father. And uh, we ended up staying in touch and ended up going together because we said we always would if that ever happened. And uh, I'm, I like all music though. I've been I've listened to anything and everything really. If there's, uh, but if I lean one way, it's classic rock. Where did my closing question, how did the Clippers and Abel uh, become married together? Well, at the old ballpark, um, when it was Jet Stadium, they actually even Redbird Stadium, there was an old fire bell that was mounted on top of the roof, and there was a press, the press box was up on the roof. And every time that the Redbirds or the Jets won a game, the little clubhouse, the little press box attendant would come out on the roof and ring the bell. So when we created and we remodelized, remodeled what became Franklin County Stadium, uh, the fire department had had the bell gave it back to us. So we actually took that bell and mounted it at that point in time in Dysart Park. And it now actually sits out in the concourse at Huntington Park between the left field building and the Donato stand down the third base side. So yeah, out of that, we uh, we came up with the song, Ring Your Bell and Hometown Heroes. You gotta have a two-sided hit when you do a record. And we started with the victory bells and uh, 
in the old place, we, we really, really had it rocking. Now, we've stepped away a little bit uh, from that, but we've actually started to bring it back. And every Sunday, we now give the first 500 kids get a victory bell when they come into the ballpark. So that's a, that's a classic promotion that we've done over the years. And some of those playoff games at the old facility, when we'd hand out 10,000 victory bells, the clamor and, and the noise, it just drove the visiting team crazy. It was really cool to see. Is the is, is the is the bobblehead a thing of the past, or would there be any bobblehead giveaways? Would it be the best giveaways at Huntington Park this season? No bobblehead giveaways this year. I, not a thing of the past, but we try to not, you know, uh, really uh, overdo it. Um, try to keep it a little more special. Um, giveaways: the the bells for kids on Sundays are are, are real popular. Um, we uh, are working on a, a couple other things um, as part of the tied into some of the promotions we have on the schedule right now. Um, but uh, you know, there'll be a few still to come. Getting some uh, some some fans and some tiles. I'm assuming those kind of things are popular with the fans. Um, trade baseball trading cards. Still have them. Still have them. Yep. Yep. Um, as we conclude, um, for our listeners, talk about some of the um, names that people will recognize that stopped through and wore a Clippers uniform. Just a few. Well, I mean, the, the Yankees of the early 90s, when we were with them, Derek Jeter, Mariano Rivera, Andy Pettit, Jorge Posada, Bernie Williams, Gerald Williams. And then as we got started at Huntington Park with Cleveland, Corey Kluber, Carlos Santana. Um, Francisco Lindor. Francisco Lindor, yeah, quite, quite a few. You also had prime time. We had prime time. We had Neon Dion back at the old ball. Park. I saw a picture of him in a Clippers uniform. Uh, Few, a few days ago. I don't know why I was looking at it. It's like uh, on my phone, of course. So prime time was here. Uh, when he, you know what he did when he would when he would step into the batter's box, he'd flip his bat upside down with the knob of his bat. He'd draw a dollar sign in the, in the batter's box, and they'd straddle that for his swing. True story. I, yeah, I believe it. I believe. It. I believe. It. Special, special, special athlete for sure. And the Clippers had a lot of them, like the names you just read yeah. off. So. Yeah, Michael Brantley so, was another good name and quite a few guys. Fans, The fans have been very lucky in Columbus to see some major league players before they got big, to see them develop and put on their finishing touches here and then go up and make their mark at the major league level. That's that's a pretty neat experience to have. And you know, a lot of these kids are very accessible down here. So endless pictures of families that, that they've taken with Carlos Santana and Michael Brantley and Corey Kluber and Shane Bieber and stuff. Those are memories that, that are made and they last forever. All right, we are, we are wrapping up. I'm glad to uh, say that Opening day uh, here in Huntington Park will be here soon, and I hope that it's a sellout. So, listeners of Talk of the County, turn out, support your Franklin County Columbus Clippers. And in closing, be yourself because no one else has time to. Thank you. Thank you.